Fox TV affiliate in Washington, D.C., which is WTTG Channel 5, used to show movies on weekend afternoons. And I remember being young, maybe five, six, seven years old, let's say kindergarten or first grade, and I remember seeing a movie on Channel 5 some weekend, and I didn't see the whole movie, I didn't see the beginning or the end, but I remember a scene in the movie where there was a man, a Russian man, with a beard, and he was on the run, he was hiding from people in a department store. And he ducked behind a counter, and I think it was uh, a perfume counter. I, I still haven't <laughs> watched the, the movie, even as an adult, so I, I'm going purely by my memory from childhood. But uh, he hid behind what I believe was the perfume counter, and there was a, a girl working there who uh, he was looking at desperately and, and he sort of implored her to hide him from the people who were looking for him. And he, uh, he looked up at her and he said, I defect, I defect. He was a Russian and this was during the Cold War, the Soviet era, and he was defecting to the United States. And when the people who were looking for him came up to the perfume counter, the girl who was working there said that she hadn't seen him. And eventually they were satisfied and they walked away. The movie, as it turns out, as I found out when the title was announced during a station break, was Moscow on the Hudson. And the actor playing the Russian was Robin Williams who I realized I had seen before. I had seen him in Mork and Mindy, which I watched in reruns and thought was great. Uh, and I would encounter him many times in many different roles before I ever considered myself a fan of his because he was one of those actors who worked a lot and appeared and a lot of things, and over the last week or so since his death, I've thought about a lot of the Robin Williams movies that I've seen over the years, and the ones that I've enjoyed, and the ones that I haven't really enjoyed, and I keep going back to what, in my memory, is the first time I ever saw him in a film, which was Moscow on the Hudson. I should probably go back and watch that again at some point. This past week on Facebook and Twitter, etc., I've seen more comments than I can count from people who have said essentially the same thing, that they don't normally care about celebrity deaths, but the death of Robin Williams is different. They don't usually feel a, a sense of loss or sadness when an actor or some other entertainer dies, but, but Robin Williams is different. They feel his loss. And why is that? What is What was it about him as a performer and, and as, as a, a person, as far as we could discern that as members of his audience, what was it about him that endeared him so to us that, that this many people would say, I don't usually care when famous people die, but this this one hurts. I can tell you from my own experience, which I think is shared generally by a lot of the people who are saying these things, that Robin Williams has been with me since I was a kid. That his work was so eclectic and and his his filmography was so diverse and appealed to such a broad spectrum of audiences that I think a lot of us feel like we've been with him and he's been with us ever since we were children. I watched Mork and Mindy when I was a kid, in reruns mostly, because I, I wasn't born until 1980, but uh, I remember being maybe three or four, five years old or so, and you know, watching Mork and Mindy reruns uh, on one of my local TV stations.
He was the voice of the genie in Aladdin. He did Mrs. Doubtfire. He did Hook. He did lots of movies that were aimed at a younger audience. And then he also did more adult things. He did things like One Hour Photo or Insomnia or one of my favorite Robin Williams movies, uh, World's Greatest Dad which from a few years ago, which I thought was just an awesome movie. And he was so, so good in that. And a very adult movie, a very grown-up, dark comedy. So he, you can grow up with him. You could watch him as a child and watch him in cartoons and watch him do silly movies and watch him on TV playing Mork the Crazy Alien. But then you can also go to his more mature work. One of the most moving things I've seen in the last week since he died was I've gone back and, and looked at some of his early, early stand-up from uh, the 70s when he was doing his nightclub act. And there's a, a, a clip that's been making the rounds on uh, YouTube since he died of uh, him like climbing up into the balcony to, to talk directly to the people in the audience. He's in a theater and he just scales like, like a, like a, a gorilla, like a chimpanzee. He scales the, the side of the, uh, of the balcony and, and gets right up with the people sitting there in that box. And, and in a sense, and I'm not trying to be cutesy with this. I'm not trying to be precious, but in a sense, that's what he always did as a performer, whether he was doing stand up or whether he was acting in a comedy or whether he was acting in a drama. He, he would go out into the audience. He would reach out to you. He would go to where you were. And, and that touched people. He, he wanted to make that connection with his audience. And we, in turn, made it with him. And to have that connection between performer and audience, which any performer can tell you is an intoxicating and powerful thing. Whether you're a performer in front of a live audience or whether you're a performer on film or on television or on radio or whatever, that connection between a performer and an audience is a powerful thing. And it's a powerful thing from where the performer stands and it can also be very powerful from the audience. And to have that connection between we, the audience, and Robin Williams, uh, be severed so abruptly and so tragically is tough to swallow. Of course, the outpouring of sadness and appreciation and respect in the wake of Robin Williams's death has been the rule, but that doesn't mean there have not been exceptions to that rule. There have been some really contemptible things said in the wake of his death. Uh, some people implying that he took the coward's way out by committing suicide. And other comments have come from within my own community, or one of my communities, uh, the atheist community, the online atheist community. Uh, the American Atheist's Twitter account asked, really, it seemed like within a few hours of the announcement of Robin Williams' death, if we thought that Robin Williams was an atheist. They posted a tweet that said, some people speculated that Robin Williams may have been an atheist. What do you think? And a lot of people, myself included, found that to be a little ghoulish, you know, a little uh, inappropriate, a little opportunistic. And then uh, shortly after that, PZ Myers uh, responded to that tweet by saying that uh, Robin Williams probably wasn't an atheist because he made what dreams may come. And according to PZ Myers' tweet, no atheist could watch that movie without throwing up. No self-respecting atheist could watch that movie without throwing up, according to P.Z. Myers. Now, I'm not trying to make more out of P.Z. Myers' comments than he intended. I'm not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill, but I do want to sort of focus on the attitude that is exemplified in that tweet. I consider myself a self-respecting atheist. I don't hide my atheism from anybody. I don't take a back seat as far as being outspoken about my atheism to anybody. I try not to be a jerk about it, but I never have and never will apologize for it either. And I think What Dreams May Come is a good movie. Uh, and any problems that I may have with it have nothing to do with my atheism. The fact that the film is about a man who dies and goes to heaven and discovers heaven being this particular place and then he has to go to hell to rescue the spirit of his despairing wife. And these are all things that I don't think could ever actually happen. But you know, I don't think Star Trek could actually happen either. 
I don't think Superman could actually happen. I, there are a lot of films that are based in fantasy that I that do not reflect my beliefs that I nonetheless can appreciate. There are religious films like there some there have been some tremendous movies made about the Jesus story. Now I do not believe that Jesus was the son of God. I do not believe that the story told in the gospels is historically accurate. Not for a second do I believe that. But uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini's Gospel According to St. Matthew is a brilliant film. Martin Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ is a brilliant film. Even D.W. Griffith's original black and white silent version of King of Kings has some great value as a film, I think, even though it's a lot more hagiographic than the other ones I described. But nonetheless, just because I don't believe in it, just because it doesn't reflect my personal beliefs, doesn't mean that I automatically wash my hands of it and I can't appreciate it. It's a really narrow-minded attitude that is going to cut you off from a whole multitude of art that you could otherwise engage with and find enlightening and ennobling and entertaining that doesn't necessarily reflect your own beliefs right back at you. It's such a shame to see that attitude voiced whenever I see it because, you know, one of the things about art, about enjoying film, about enjoying a book, about enjoying anything that makes it so valuable is not just you connecting to it, but the artist connecting to you. The artist telling you something about him or herself. You know, that's an important part of art. The artist communicating their values and their perspective and their beliefs and what's important to them outward to you in the audience. And that's something that Robin Williams's work, at its best, and even at its worst, did. And that's one of the reasons why we feel his loss so acutely, I think. And it's just a shame that people like P.Z. Myers, apparently, are incapable of appreciating that. One of my dearest friends, Christopher, a.k.a. Varjak, the guy I mentioned in the Off Monday Ramble episode I did about the Batman website I used to go to, uh, he is someone whose taste I really respect and whose judgment I really trust when it comes to movies and art and things like that. We have a few disagreements, but we mostly see eye to eye on everything and, and have the same similar perspective and uh, he once wrote something I forget if it was a short story or if it was a, an essay about something but he cited Robin Williams as his example of a great actor and I always remembered that and I thought of that you know this last week or so as, as I've been thinking about Robin Williams a lot uh, that he didn't say Robert De Niro, you know, he didn't say like someone like I might say like Robert Mitchum or or someone like that, someone who's who's typically thought of as like a great actor. Um, he said Robin Williams, and I agree with him. I think Robin Williams was a great actor and a great comic and a, a great entertainer. I think for many years when he was sort of the default choice for funniest person in the world um i think that was deserved i think that was legitimate he was a monumental talent and what was it that made him so great what was it that made him stand out from the rest and i think it was his sense of empathy i think it was that he always gave a performance whether it was a comic performance or a serious performance he always gave a richly empathetic performance. He seemed like he was one of us. He was a human being with feelings and frailties. He never seemed to be holding himself above his audience. He seemed to be holding himself right down here among us. And there were times when that empathy went a little overboard and it, it sort of spilled over into cheese, into schmaltz, uh, into the saccharin. That happened a lot with Robin Williams. I mean, I, I think of things like uh, Bicentennial Man or uh, Patch Adams is another great example. Hook, I think a lot of Hook falls into that category where it just, the, 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 the empathy goes too far and it, it, it turns into something very, very trite and very treacly. Um, but it comes from a good place. It comes from that capacity he had to be relatable. To, to feel, to be empathetic, to be a human. He was a wonderfully humanistic performer, no matter what he was doing. Uh, he had 
eyes that were just incredible. His eyes could convey such sadness, but they could also twinkle with mischief and they could light up with joy and energy. I mean, he the eyes are the key to any performer. That's what made Buster Keaton so brilliant. That's what made Charlie Chaplin so brilliant was they had amazingly expressive eyes. Um, and Robin Williams had those and a face that went right along with it. And a wonderful everyman type of face. Handsome, but not in the typically rugged, chiseled, handsome way of like a, of a, a stereotypical movie star. A very expressive face. A very relatable face. A very easy to read face. A face that could convey a lot of really hard, heavy, complex emotions without doing a whole lot. When he did Live at the Met, there was no big set. There wasn't like a lot of stagecraft. It was just Robin Williams on the stage with a wireless mic talking to the audience. And he commanded that entire room. He commanded that massive, legendary theater with just him and his voice and his wit. And he chose to end it with a bit about fatherhood with a bit about his son Zach who at the time was very young that was funny was very funny but was also so sweet and so tender and I thought that that was such a ballsy choice as a performer to to end his his very funny show and his very sarcastic show uh, with this moment of wonderful still funny but wonderfully sincere and wonderfully tender and, and sweet and human. And I think that could serve decently well, as well as anything could, as, as sort of a, a microcosm of, of his entire career as a performer. That yes, he was capable of making people laugh in really, really deep ways. I mean, he, he could make you laugh so hard that you, you, couldn't, you could hardly control yourself. But he also had an eye toward the human, an eye toward the emotional and, and the sincere. And sincerity is something that we don't value nearly as much as we should, especially in our entertainment. And Robin Williams had that. He had empathy and he had sincerity. And when you combine that in someone as prodigiously talented as, as he was, um, you just, <laughs> I mean, how, how could you not love him? And, and how could you not miss him terribly now that he's gone?